Today we're gonna to talk about hash functions and see how much they really matter and how well our hash table performs. Welcome back everybody. I've been on a little bit of a hash table kick lately. If you're just joining us, be sure to check out the previous few videos. It will make today's video probably make a little more sense. Unless you're the kind of person who likes jumping into conversations halfway through, in which case, no worries. Thanks for being here. All the source code I'm looking at today, as well as all the other source code from all my other videos is available as usual through Patreon. Thanks for supporting the channel. But today my goal is to look at hash functions. So, so far we haven't really focused on hash functions. We've focused on the table and how we manage the data structure. But today I wanna to look at some other hash functions that we could have used and see if they make much of a difference. So let's jump into the code. So last time I mentioned this hash function, this is the hash function that we've been playing with. And I never claimed that it was a great hash function. It's just the first one that I threw together in the very first hash table video that I made. It tries to create a somewhat randomness. I mean, it's not a random number, but we are looking for good dispersion. We're basically looking for different strings to produce hash values that are scattered across our table really well. We don't want our data to clump together and we definitely don't want collisions whenever possible. We'd like as few collisions as possible. So today I want to look at collisions and hash functions. Now, in order to do this, there is something I need to do. I need to change my hash table because right now we don't have a good way of getting the number of collisions that we're seeing. So I want to add just a, another function down here. And let's just assume that we might someday want to look at a large number of collisions. So let's make it return a UN64T and call this hash table collisions and pass in our hash table. Okay, so this is just going to return the number of collisions we've had since the creation of the hash table. If we wanted to add extra bells and whistles, we could give you the ability to reset this value, but for today, this will be good enough. So let's come back into here. Now, the first thing I need to do is to actually keep track in the hash table of the number of collisions. Let's be sure to set the number of collisions to zero when we create the hash table right here. And then let's just come down here to the bottom and add this new function. And all it's gonna do is return the number of collisions, okay? So really small change to our hash table, really nothing to worry about, nothing crazy. Let's make sure I didn't break anything though. Anytime we change something, there's a chance that we broke it. So then we can come back here into our test. Now you remember before what I was doing is my test was reading in a list of words, adding those words to the hash table. It's a long list of words. And so then the only thing I wanna do here, so we can still, we're still gonna get the number of words loaded in the table. We're still gonna be making our random guesses. But what I would like to do down here is also print out right here before before we, before we move on to our guessing, let's just look at the number of collisions we run into. So I'm going to put with and LU collisions. And then here we're just going to call our hash table collisions function. Okay. So now if we come in here, oh, and one other thing I just realized I had left in this my cleanup. Let's take this out because this is going to produce a ton of print output, which we don't need in our life. So let's recompile it and run it. And of course, it's reporting 20 words, no collisions. Now, one of the reasons it's reporting no collisions is that I added the ability to keep track of collisions, but I didn't actually record the number of collisions. So let's come in here and let's see, the place I wanna look at for keeping track of collisions is here in insert. And so what I wanna do is to come in here when we're doing the hash table lookup. So this is looking to see, is the thing that we're trying to add already in the table? So I don't really wanna look at that. That's just duplicates, which is separate from collisions. But what I wanna do is down here when we insert the entry. Okay, so right here, this is where we're actually going to add our new element. And I'm just gonna add really quick, I'm gonna say if, the ith element, the place, the index element, the place where we're going to add this, if it is not null, okay, meaning there's something already there in that bucket, then we're going to say ht collisions plus plus, okay? So basically anytime that we add something into a bucket that already has something in it, so anytime we're going to chaining, this is going to be a collision. Okay, so let's come back down here, let's recompile, let's make the, and let's run this. Now I'm going to run it with my long word list because with the short word list, I'll probably still still end up with no collisions. Hopefully with the long one, we will get some collisions. Yeah, okay. So remember our table size, it's just over a million elements and we are trying to add just under half a million words and we're ending up with about 100,000 collisions. 
Okay, so you know, uh, is that good? Is that bad? I don't really know. If it is bad, if we could improve it, the best way to improve that is probably by using a better hash function, right? This hash function may not be doing a good job. So let's take a look. Now, when we look at hash functions, there are a lot of different options available to us. Many of these are well studied. I'm definitely not going to cover all of them. But the one that I want to start with today that's a common one, it's very fast, is the FNV family of hash functions. Okay, FNV stands for some guy's names. I can't remember off the top of my head, I'll probably in editing stick it up here. But the idea with FNV is that we're going to, instead of just, in this case, we just multiplied and added with our FNV hash. So let's just do FNV. Let's start with FNV1. There's a couple different flavors of FNV. Then what we're going to do instead is we're going to use XOR and multiplication. Okay, now if you start with the very first FNV starts out with the hash value as zero, we're going to have a for loop that goes through the whole length just like this. But then what we're going to do is we're going to have our hash value. We're going to first multiply it by a prime number. I'm going to call it FNV prime and we'll define that in just a second and spell value correctly. And then we're going to come down here and we're going to XOR the hash value with the ith character of this name. And actually while we're at it, I realize I've still called this name. This was copied over from the first example, but let's make this a little more general since it's not always going to be a name. Let's just call this text and we'll do that up here as well. Okay, so this is the FNV zero hash. Let's just come in here and do pound define FNV prime, which is just a big prime number that experimentally was shown to work pretty well. So that's just gonna be one with seven zeros, one B three, okay? Okay, so this is the first flavor of the FNV family. Most people don't use FNV zero. And the reason, interestingly, because we're dealing with XOR and multiplication is that any text that is containing just the zero character, which doesn't happen normally in text. So maybe this was yet another poor choice. Maybe I'll instead just call this, let's rename this to data. And we'll do that up here because it may not be text that we're hashing. But so as we are hashing this, essentially, if I give you a data string that has a whole bunch of zeros, like it's all zeros, then the hash value will always be zero, right? Because zero multiplied by anything is zero and zero XORed with zero is always going to be zero. So FNV zero generally isn't used. So instead, what we do is we use FNV FNV1, which changes only in one regard, and that is it uses this offset. Okay, so they'll have this FNV offset here, which let's come up here and define this. And the whole idea here is to make sure we start at something that's not going to produce zeros. We probably could start with just about any number here, but apparently experimentally it was determined by FN and V that this number, which is what, CBF29, and I'll just drop this in here. Hopefully I reproduce that properly. But basically you always start out with some crazy number and then all of this mixing, all of this multiplying and XORing is very unlikely to ever end up with a hash value of zero, which is where things start to get a little weird. So this is FNV1. There is another variant. Most people refer to this as FNV1A. And really the only thing we do here, it's exactly the same, except we're going to do the XOR first and the multiply with the prime second. Okay, so it's basically the same thing, only we're changing the order in which our operations are occurring. Okay, so now we've got two other hash functions. We have my original one, just hash, and then we have FNV1 and FNV1A. So the point of the video, of course, is I wanna see how much it, of a difference it makes if I change up the hash function. So let's come down here into our code. And thankfully, because things are really generic, I can just change this out with saying FNV1. And remember, we had about 100,000, 102,000, 336, to be precise, collisions. Now let's come down here and let's rerun this with our new hash function. And now we're down to 90,000 collisions. So it did make a difference. And really quickly, let's try 1A. And it actually brought it down even further, down to 89,500. Not a big difference, we're both pretty close, but it's definitely getting better dispersion. And we're getting, at least in the data set, in the list of words that I threw at it, which is just a big list of English words, we did get improvements in terms of our hashing performance. Now, one thing to keep in mind whenever we're looking at hash functions, so one thing about these hash functions, the reason I picked them is because they are fast, right? XOR and multiplication are fairly fast operations. You might wonder, how they compare in speed with this hash. Well, let's find out really quick. So if we come back to our original hash function, let's just time this whole thing. 
And so we're ending up with 0.6 seconds to run the whole thing. Let's just run it a couple of times just to make sure. Okay, now let's try it with FNV1. And FNV1 and FNV1A should be they should be the same as far as performance, as they're basically doing the same operations. So you'll notice that at least this first run, yeah, it looks like FNV is most of the time a little bit faster than my original hash function. Um, not dramatically so, but maybe a little bit. It definitely looks like the average is a little bit faster. Now, one other thing to keep in mind when you're looking at hash functions is you need to think about what the purpose of this hashing is. So these functions that we're looking at, first of all, there's there are a lot of other functions you could look at. Uh, some are more computationally involved, but might give you better hashing performance. But there's a class of hashing functions called cryptographically secure hashing functions, and those are specifically designed to make it difficult for you to create collisions, intentional collisions. Now, the FNV family of hash functions is not cryptographically secure. It's designed to be fast. It's designed to work fairly well for hash table performance. But if you need something that is cryptographically secure, then you want to look at something that's a little beefier, something like SHA-256. Let me know down in the comments if you would like to see a video about cryptographic hash functions. I'm definitely happy to take a look at that in a future video, but this is all the time I have for today. But the point of this video is to talk about hash tables and the impact of hashing performance on table performance. And so this is where I'm going to stop. I hope you learned something new. I hope this was useful. Subscribe so you don't miss future content. Like it if you liked it. If you didn't like it, tell a friend to stay away from this channel so they'll be sure to check it out just due to curiosity. And until next week, I'll see you later.